Yeah, I'm still at Jebel Madar. I love this Jebel so much, I didn't want to leave. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about burial diagenesis and what happens during mid to late burial stages to carbonate rocks. And that's really the last theme we need to explore in this uh, course. And then you have all the theory that you need to understand carbonate reservoir. So jump in the car. We have a five hour drive. We're going back to the Oman Mountains. <music> Well, after a few hours of driving, we're back in the Oman mountain. It's much cooler. We're in Wadi Sahtan. I spend a lot of time here with multiple generations of students looking at what is right behind me on the cliffs. It's the Permian limestone, which are at the base of the cliffs. And on top of the Permian limestone, we have the Permian early dolomite. So these are reflux style dolomite. But you can also notice a very red feature, and that red feature is an iron-rich late dolomite. And that picked our interest because late iron-rich dolomite usually is associated with burial systems and often with circulation of fluid along fractures. So let's explore in this class the different processes that can happen when you bury the rock beyond the reach of just a superficial burial. So looking at the different zone of diagenesis in terms of how deep and shallow they can happen, we have surficial diagenesis that we've already discussed with uh, meteoric diagenesis, marine diagenesis, co cohout diagenesis, that was the uh, marine system that when we talked about um, dolomitization. But below the surficial burial diagenesis boundary, we go into the intermediate burial regimen. And this is where the conate fluids are mostly marine waters that have been slightly modified. And if you bring this even deeper, you go into the deep burial regime, and that's characterized by basinal brine, where you have brines that are in contact with, with host rocks, so a lot of chemical exchange here happening that circulates through the rock. And eventually, if you go beyond that deep burial regimen, you go into the metamorphic rock regimen, which is not what we're going to be teaching in this uh, class. And the exact boundary between diagenesis and metamorphism is debated. It depends how you look at it. It depends at what type of rock you're looking at. But a classic boundary is one based on pressure and temperature, and typically we recognize that beyond 200 degree, 250 degree, you are leaving the realm of diagenesis and you're entering the realm of metamorphism. But it's important to realize that this is a, a, a zone rather than a boundary. And really metamorphism is the continuation of diagenesis, but in probably higher uh, rock to water ratio. So less water and higher temperatures. But the important message is that if you look at the burial regime, it's characterized by two things. It's characterized by an increase in pressure and an increase in temperature. Now, the increase in pressure depends on the hydrostatic pressure, the pressure of the fluid, and the lithostatic pressure, which is the pressure of the rock. And the blue line here represents the typical zone for limestone. So you see depth on the vertical axis and pressure on the horizontal axis. Now, temperature depends on the geothermal gradient, of course, and the geothermal gradient can vary vastly from 10 degrees per kilometer all the way to typically 25, 30 degrees per kilometer, but it can be as high as 50 or 60 degrees per kilometer depending on what type of tectonic regime you are at. So that plays a big role in controlling temperature. So what happened in the early stage of burial? Well, on this plot, you see burial depth on the vertical axis versus porosity on the horizontal axis. And we can look at three different type or three different scenarios. If we have grain stones, we will tend to have a mechanical reorganization at the beginning. So, so before a hundred meter, where you have a little bit of crushing, a little bit of movement, and you lose a little bit of porosity. It's not as important as in classic sense because of the prevalence of cementation and carbonate. 
And then in those grain stone, unless you have ductile grains that could be squashed and then you lose a bit more porosity, but if it's not the case, nothing really happens for several hundreds of meters until the point where you reach a pressure high enough that the contact between grains of limestone starts to dissolve. And that's the pressure solution zone that we'll talk about in a few minutes. If you're looking at shelf mud, as we've seen in the previous class, the shelf mud have a tendency to dewater under compaction. So dewatering means that the very high porosity of those mud will quickly diminish thanks to dewatering up to 100 meter. And then again, nothing will happen until we reach pressure solution, even for those very fine grain carbonate sediments. And if you're looking at ooze, which is kind of an intermediate case, ooze are effectively solid component, larger than the mud, but nevertheless, relatively small, much smaller than the grainstone. And so typically there will tend to have mechanical reorganization at first, followed by grain crushing, because these are pretty fragile grains. So we lose a bit of, of uh, porosity, then nothing, then pressure solution that will also decrease porosity. So pressure solution can take several form. It starts with the grain contact themselves. When the grain in contact starts to dissolve, we have what we, we uh, term microstylolites forming. And here's a beautiful example from the lower Cretaceous of Oman of microstylolites. So you can see two peloids here, and in between them is this zone of dissolution, which is the microstylolite. If you uh, continue this process and you start to see these dissolution seams at the scale of a core, you have what is known as a proper stylolite. And the amplitude of the stylolite, so the difference between the highs and the low, represent the total volume of limestone that was dissolved. So that limestone needs to go somewhere. So here I'm showing you an example that we've published on the, um, the Cenozoic sediments offshore from New Zealand. And if you look at the thin section, these are relatively deep carbonate. They're quite muddy. You can see we have planktic foraminifers in them and a lot of uh, mud. But what's interesting is to look at this under a catalyluminescence microscope. And you can see that we see a lot of luminescence in the micrite. And that's significant because normally marine sediments are non-luminescent. And so that indicates that there's been the deposition of a cement after deposition of the sediment, so a burial cement. And the source for that burial cement is, of course, the dissolution of the stylolite. So stylolite can play a big role in impacting porosity and permeability because on the one hand, stylolite can be a contact that can be popped open to allow fluids to circulate. But on the other hand, the dissolution at the plane of contact of the stylolite leads to precipitation of a calcite cement in the mass of the rock. So that could really lead to a decrease in matrix porosity. And stylolite can be relatively large. Here's an example from not so far from where I stand in the Oman mountain. And you can see that these stylolites are maybe 10 centimeters across, so a large volume of dissolution here. And in this case, it's not linked to burial per se, it's also linked to the formation of the Oman Mountain. Now, you can also have a case where we don't have actually a proper stylolite, but we have what we term a wispy seam. So that's essentially some tiny evidence of dissolution that forms some nice little um, seams of dissolution. And you see them because just like in the stylolite, the black material that is preserved here and, and highlights the seam is the insoluble residue of the limestone. So once you've dissolved the limestone, these are concentrated at the plane of the stylolite or the um, seams. And these seams can then be reused by further fluid and then you get solution seams. And this is a beautiful example. Again, all of this is from offshore New Zealand of the um, seams that have been used as a dissolution pathway. So that's, that's a solution enhanced seams. 